I got it. I, I thought it, whenever you're sharing a screen, the controls become a bit obtuse and I had to look a little bit harder for it. So welcome to the risk working group meeting for March 4th, 2021. Just for those of us who are new, um, I'd maybe like to offer, let me offer a brief introduction to where we are. I'll keep it to 60 seconds or less. We've had many, many discussions about dependencies. Uh, over the course of uh, the last couple of weeks, we came up with this list of needs and motivations, as well as resources and links related to uh, uh, dependencies, as well as security vulnerabilities, which are interrelated to each other. And um, so it's a two tab spreadsheet. You can find it in the working group meeting notes from last week which I will copy link URL and place into chat. Well, I think I'll place it in the chat. Um, and I'll also sort of leave it at the top of our Our spreadsheet here so that it's easily accessed in the future and through the course of that discussion we started to enumerate um, sort of what we consider our minimum viable product metrics for writ for dependencies uh, in this risk working group um, and that minimum viable product sort of um, evolved, uh, let's see. It is down here. Um, so repository dependency enumeration, uh, sustainability risks, uh, dependency range, how many, how often is it referenced? There's a statistic called Libier that is in that spreadsheet of resources I shared a minute ago, enumerating vulnerabilities, OSF store scorecarding, and then a matrix of the same. And so I think that's another piece of information maybe um, to keep sort of at uh, in this spreadsheet, I'll call this the MVP, MVPs tab and paste it right there and even go so far as to well i think i can yeah forget it i won't i won't uh i'll just use bolding on underlining to indicate that's an enumeration but i think there are some things that need to be indented in the translation and i'll come back to that part later just keep it here. So that's, that's kind of where we've been at. And last week, we started active work on the first of these MVP metrics, which um, evolves to language level upstream dependency enumeration. And we, so upstream and downstream, we all talk about those words, and often they become words people are confused about. And so these are projects that the project you're working on depend upon. And this is the work that we started to do. So part of each of these meetings is um, actively working on some of these MVP metrics. So that's, um, that's sort of the introduction to where we have been um, and what we've been doing um, up until, you know, over the last several weeks for folks who are new uh, to this working group uh, or haven't spent a lot of time in it previously. So with that, I think we've got some new faces and I would welcome you to introduce yourselves. I can call you out individually or you can volunteer um, or Matt can volunteer you uh, based on perhaps he knows you. Sure, Alyssa. <laughs> there. 
Uh, well, hello all, um, great to be here. I I'm coming from um, the Sustain community um, and Open Source Collective, and we have uh, we have been um, interested in uh, building dependency uh, graph tools. Um, and uh, Matt and Georg joined us uh, last week, and we realized there's a lot of alignment in uh, some of the conversations that we've been having and, and what you seem to be developing here. So. Um, uh, personally, I'm really excited about combining our efforts. Um, the dependency working group in the sustained community has been a lot about, um, like I would say, like almost like startup initiatives and questions um, and experiments, um, and really interested to understand like what the current conversations um, have looked like here and what you know you've been building, and also how we can. Um, kind of combine efforts to really move um, work, like move work forward. And so I, I personally am um, not a developer, but really interested in how um, this, um, this influences and, our, um, and informs our, our understanding of, of community, community health, which clearly aligns with, with what we're doing here. So, um, yeah, excited to be here. And, and I'll pass it off to Richard, who's also coming from the Sustain uh, Working Group. Love being called out, thank you. Um, <laughs> so from my perspective, also from the Sustain community, we had, a, we had a working group that's been going on for, you know, past few months. Um, it, the focus has really been dependencies mapping. How do you know what dependencies are where in your ecosystem? Um, and I think the reason for focusing on that has been how do we get money to those projects, right? If you give back to your dependency tree, what does that look like? How do you know where that money goes? How do you put it in escrow? How do you make sure it's portioned fairly? How do you stop bad actors? Uh, what algorithms do you use? And we've been trying to figure out how to do that for a while, but it's also been kind of ad hoc and there's a few different stakeholders and it's been hard to keep the conversation sort of flowing in a consistent way. So it looks like the risk working group is much more focused on risk assessment for dependency managements, right? Um, how are dependencies long terms? Are they stable or not? Are they going to affect upstream usage? Uh, are those dependencies actually are the community stable? Which is a really interesting question that's related to our question. Um, I'm not sure if I really have a, a, a horse to pick in this one. Right, I'm, I'm kind of just here because I'm interested in the technical problems of how do you figure out who's working on what dependencies. Um, eventually, I would like to lead to a world into which we actually sustainably give back to maintainers who want it financially such that there's a more um, equitable ecosystem and there's less long-term infrastructural damage where you have both the degradation of the commons and also uh, bad actors, um, large industries and corporations who basically take stuff extractively away from dependency trees. Um, I don't know what that looks like, especially with licensing itself being an ethical issue, but certainly I wanna see what approaches you all are taking um, and see how that's going. And hopefully I didn't just get too far into the weeds with my own personal thinking, but that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and then, then as far as like where I work, who knows, man, who knows? But I think sustain might be the closest relevant bucket to put me in which is just a community of people interested in talking about how do you do sustainable software. Okay. I took notes with you under the sustain heading. So that was a, an excellent guess on my part, I suppose. Cool. And sorry for talking so fast. I know you're trying to take notes and I really appreciate that. No, 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 no problem. I, I, pre I appreciate it. I think, I think you'll find that we're not really thinking about dependencies a lot differently than, than what you're describing. I think we're thinking about right now, at least, where we're at is what's the minimum viable product for how do you, what are the names and descriptions of the, the metrics that we can use and then develop software for to keep track of um, some of those things. Which I think it's very similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our, our end goals might be slightly different uh, given the name of this working group. I'm assuming that right. Risk is not really what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking more about payback or give back or something, but the methods are identical. So Really yeah. cool. Really great to see this work happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I think the I think the framing or the name of the working group is different than than sustains, but but ultimately we've identified dependencies as a factor in risk, and we I think we've arrived at a same at a very similar, if not pretty close to the same place from different points of view. 
I was going to say, for what it's worth, Richard, we uh, the concept of dependencies was uh, existing in a variety of different working groups. So risk yeah. being one, value being another working group. And it just over time, it just seems like the conversation kind of had to settle in one place and it just happened to be here, so. And then- Makes sense to me, especially given chaos is customers, right? Um, like the people who are stakeholders in the community tend to be larger corporations, which are more interested in risk assessment at some level than give back. Not to say they're not interested in both, that's just been my perspective as an outsider. I may be wrong. And we have Alexander too. Alexander, do you have voice? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm a PhD student uh, from the University um, of Göttingen um, from Germany. And well, I'm interested in yeah, risk in a broader sense. Um, I'm currently interested in uh, software quality evolution and I got invited here by uh, Georg. Um, we had a chat about our project, Smart Shark, um, which is a little bit similar to um, Metrics Grimoire, <coughs> uh, in that we collect a lot of um, static software metrics. And well, in my work, I'm currently interested in uh, mapping some of the static software metrics to possible defects that are later occurring in the code. And well, I'm very interested in what um, dependencies uh, can maybe add to that. All right, well, nice, thank you. Nice to meet you, yeah. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you as well. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us today. So this is the agenda that we sort of laid out um, based to some extent on what we talked about last week. Um, Repository dependency enumeration is the metric that we had sort of concluded last week working on. And so continuing to sort of spend some time working on that this week is um, one of the things we put on the agenda, looking a little bit deeper at sustainability risk and how they might how that might relate to existing metrics and other working groups. Um, and then some of these these other questions possibly for discussion. Um, tell me, I guess, uh, would the group like to, I don't, where would like, where would folks like to start? Uh, would like to start by doing a little bit of work or would we like to start by ha having some broader discussion in light of the new folks who are here? I think it might be more constructive to start broad. I think for the, the new folks that are joining this, we had many very broad conversations where we let ourselves kind of go in and out of all of the weeds before we settled where we did. Um, but I think forcing you to get into our narrow scope immediately might be harder to have a producting, productive session immediately. So I would say having more of a broader conversation, especially if there are more new folks, I think would be more productive. And then maybe using that as a way to, to provide an overview of how we narrowed it down to this point and why. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think if anyone has thought about dependencies, they know how broad this topic is. And I think I've heard the descriptions coming from, from Richard and Alyssa and Alex that this really can go in a number of directions. Um, <laughs> so I think we have gone in all of those or many of them <laughs> and we can continue to do that. So uh, <laughs> I guess I'm very long winded way of saying, let's start with number two or okay. B. B. You got there eventually. Yeah, no, it was a very, it was, <laughs> it that was good. Um, so, so I suppose a good, good place to start is when we talk about sustainability risk and we are thinking about project activity, um, issue closure, how many committers, the stability of some core, those are, those are some of the factors we think about that, that have metrics that exist in chaos and other working groups. How, how much does that sort of sustainability risk play into your consideration of some of the things you talked about regarding um, bad actors or um, support, support uh, helping to 
you know. Like his sustainability for first sustain, maybe, maybe take a maybe from a from the perspective of either that list of sustainability risk or when we look at our accumulated list of motivations, this is the list of, of motivations that we came up with for why we care or different parties care about uh, dependencies and what chaos can do. And I'm, I think I'd be curious perhaps how some of the new, is it, Sophia, what do you think? Is this a possibly helpful way of having this discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think we even might want to narrow it a bit more in your preface because I think it'll naturally expand. Okay, please help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, I guess where if I interpreted Sean correctly, um, there are, it sounds like getting a, a broader perspective on areas beyond risk that factor into why we would be tracking dependencies. So we kind of went through a use case exercise and a persona exercise earlier. Um, I don't know where that landed. I think that's, I'm looking at it right now, groups and communities, um, why they might care or not care about it. Um, and then I think the second piece is we were thinking about seg separating the distinction of being able to enumerate direct and indirect dependencies from the various dimensions that you'd want to track on top of that. So in the case of say something like the project is, is supported or not supported, or it has an active community or doesn't, or has, has been taken over by a bad actor. Um, those are all reasons why you would want to know you're dependent on that project to be able to keep track of what those secondary dimensions are. So either we could start with a conversation of rehashing the the role piece to see if there's anything that we missed in our view so we can can be a little bit more comprehensive and I think I think I guess for us the rationale of starting at this level is that when we start to pick individual metrics by having a comprehensive list it helps us to be a lot more targeted and why we're starting with this one metric because we clearly can be there's so many things that we could do um, so I guess from the sustained folks um, we started first with this kind of persona conversation, the groups and communities that might use dependency information and what would they use it for? Um, and it sounds like, uh, Richard, you had mentioned um, a way to think about give back or like, I'm curious how, how this relates to dependency and if you could enumerate who that is most important to it from your perspective. I'm gonna pass it off to Richard, but let, let me give like a, what it always seems like a really simple example from the perspective and community that I, I'm thinking of uh, for, first. Um, and Dwayne pointed this out to me that a, a number of, um, you know how there's a, the contributor fund, which kind of activates an in, you know, internal uh, company to vote on where to, um, per, where to uh, give financial support to an open source project the, there's general awareness here of the contributor fund right yes yeah. okay um uh Duane pointed out once to me that um within like the f f um within the first three months of voting um like multiple companies gave to the same project um and it sort of spoke to me of like there are, are um, open source projects that are good at fundraising that they have a um a a, a momentum behind them, and that uh, and that there are um, there are uh, stakeholders that are um, aware of their importance in in their work, and that it's important for them to like provide uh, support for their um, you know con continued success. Um, but there are all these other projects that might be smaller, that aren't as visible, that like may not be as quote popular or, you know, uh, have the same facility in, in fundraising that are, are nonetheless like there and um, may not be voted on necessarily because they're not necessarily visible um, to the, and, and they're, 
the the um i hate to use this word because you probably have a better like grounding in it but like the return on investment for certain projects is is may not be as uh visible and so for me one of the things that can be um, powerful about like mapping dependencies. And I always picture like, you know, a supply chain is that it will kind of bring to surface and bring to light, like the importance of these smaller projects that get missed um, in a conversation about what to um, sustain, what's important. Um, and also can lift up the, the, the awareness that, um, stakeholders do rely on on certain projects, not only like these big ones, but the, these smaller ones and how much, um, and how much is, is the importance of them being like active agents in their, um, you know, continued uh, growth. So I really do want to pass it over to Richard because he's been part of the dependency conversation, you know, for even much longer than me, but those are some of the um, motivations from, from, from my, you know, perspective. I'm not sure that is necessary to put yourself down so much. And so, uh, Alyssa is really <laughs> great at, at back your stack, for instance, which has largely been her project, which is, um, a really interesting use case here. Cause it's not funders is, is covers all manners of sins, right? There's all types of funders. Um, there's like large, large funders like Sloan which want to give back to fund the digital infrastructure. And then there's funders like Back Your Stack or Open Collective, which want to actually mobilize smaller teams to have micro payments to actually be able to get money into their bank account so they can do work better, right? So that's not necessarily the same level of things, although they often hit the same amount of people. And then there's funders like Indeed, right? Or Dwayne, you're all familiar with him, who are like Ospos, corporate Ospos who are interested in yeah. giving back or at least shoring up risk. And then there's funders uh, like people who have just exited with a lot of Bitcoin, but are still independent developers who basically want to give back to the ecosystem in general. Uh, there's foundations. So for example, I'm thinking about the Ethereum Foundation or the Zcash Foundation, which are both set up by large crypto entities to give back to those ecosystems, which are going to want to trace dependencies in those ecosystems, but not at scale, right? Not, not for everything, just for those ecosystems in general. Then there's funders like Gitcoin, which are actually looking for projects which are underfunded, which is slightly different to, to, to give them more say so that they can be part of a wider community so that the entire ecosystem could be built up. So funders covers all sorts of different things. And there's definitely more than that, right? There's people like, like there's people who want to fund NGOs who want to fund their stacks. Um, one of the interesting questions that this always comes up for me is how do you track dependencies outside of package manifest? So how do you say what an NGO is using as far as software? And then what dependence they have when it's not entirely just a JavaScript file, right? How do, I, how, do I, how do I fund Signal? How do I do OTF type stuff, right? How do I fund large democratic institutions doing work better, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, these are very broad strokes and Sean, you're doing a great job writing them down. So thank you so much. Um, that's just funding. And I think I, I want to take a step back here. And again, I'm sorry for talking so much, but the, the stage was given to me. So thank you. I guess I won't say that. Um, but what's interesting is that Sustain is not a cohesive community. Sustain is a community of lots of different people coming together just to talk about these things, right? There's no other agenda except let's talk about it. And so there's different people. Um, so specifically in the DEP working group, we have Floss Bank, which is interested in giving back equitably algorithmically to every single dependency and highlighting you know, nodes, which are more interesting. What I really wanna highlight here is that this isn't dependency mapping so much as it's actually contributor mapping. They wanna know not you know, how many dependencies are in the tree, but how many of those dependencies come from a certain person and how can we give that person money? So a good example is when you're tracking dependencies, do you track all of JavaScript and just say, this is cool, or do you track all the packages made by Substack or made by Sindre and then try to give Sindre money? Right, so those are two different ways of looking at dependency risk. And that's really, I think you already sort of covered this a tiny bit when you think about governance models, you know, how, how good is a, is a dependency's governance and how stable is that? More than one committers I saw somewhere in this file, which is great. Um, another example was, so that's, sorry, that was uh, Floss Bank. 
um, not floss space. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. It's all right. It's an actual project. Uh, another one is Fair OSS, which is looking for maintainers of projects who would be interested in having equity assigned to them by startups, which are looking to give back to their dependency trees, which is a whole different set of dependency mapping concerns. Right? How do you have legal entities that are coming out of dependencies, which can be given sets of money that would be interesting for the ecosystem as a whole? Um, so those are two of the main people doing stuff. Back your stack is another one where we're interested in collectives of people. I'm interested in other questions as well, personally. So th those are, I think, the main motivations of the other contributors in those in those working groups. I'm interested in senescence, in general. What are we going to do in 50 years? when most of the people who are making the dependencies that currently underlie the web are dead um, and or no longer code. Senescence, um, you have to back up for me on that. Dependencies, no. dependency senescence, right? So what, what happens when, I don't know what the, what it's gonna look like, the coding world, if JavaScript is still here in a hundred years. I don't know how to spell senescence, so I'm just <laughs> Okay, yeah, and there, there may be a better word for it, right? Uh, but, um generational shift yeah or aging out basically dependencies um you know aging and not having um you know dependencies are still there but no one it's the cobalt problem okay right right yeah <laughs> so in yeah. essence it's the same root as a uh, senility right? right so sorry i i did yeah. linguistics i like fun words <laughs> fair enough um so we'll calls it little... octopedes or whatever <laughs> also a good discussion <laughs> Um, and so it's things like uh, an example of this too is also things like the dependencies that a lot of our infrastructure have on things like GCC compiler, for instance. Exactly. That but is not that's not listed as an explicit dependency, and that has an aging community. Yeah. So those. I mean, that's kind of another another thing I'm interested in. Um, I'm gonna stop talking, but that's that's like a general overview, I think, of what the sustained working group was interested in doing. And again, it's just a, a group of people trying to figure these things out too. So Sean, if remind me in the notes, because I was digging through quickly and couldn't find it quickly, but there was a place where we tried to have a broader enumeration of dependency categories. And I kind of kind of liked as Richard was talking, I was sort of thinking about general categories of things we're dependent on. And we've started with as software and code dependencies. So if you're dependent on a specific project, uh, but then as Richard was saying, you could be dependent on funding, on people, on infrastructure and on other kinds of components. So I think at one point we had started listing out what that was as part of say our broader architecture, if you will, of writing dependencies. Um, is, this the, is this the conversation that you recall? I think that's related. It, it went, I, I remember going into a spreadsheet. <laughs> okay. You remember the spreadsheet? This is like two months ago. So maybe I'm grasping. I'm so sorry. That. No, 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 it's, it's not. It's more that I want to make sure that we had all those things in there. Because I think the way that you were talking about it, I was like, I don't, I think we mentioned people, but I'm not sure if we did. It's I not this, is it this it. one? It's not that one. This is another one. <laughs> yeah, this is the one from last week where we had the, we had the needs and motivations on one tab and the resources and links on the other. Well, I'll, I'll do a little bit of digging. I don't want to derail this right now, but I just, I know, I know we had started something. So I was just trying to- What was it, Sophia? What was uh, the spreadsheet? It was in a spreadsheet where we initially listed out different category and areas of dependencies. Like that's where we separated out infrastructure from software, from people. Oh like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go dig in. It's somewhere in the notes, but we, we have okay. some notes. I'll go, I'll go. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, uh, well, I mean, don't, I, I don't want to make everyone dive back into conversations which were overly broad at, at an earlier point when I just wasn't around, you know, I'm relatively new. My birthday was yesterday. Uh, it wasn't actually, but you know, um, but I, I, I just want to, I know that you're in the weeds now trying to figure out, okay, what, what's innumerable, what isn't innumerable, how do I get this number, how do we get that number? And that's awesome. And that's really, really cool work. Um, this is just the motivation coming from, from our group. And, and I really want you to continue in your own way because I don't have a lot of, of mind space to really help out right now with coding and a new dependency tree analyzer. But these are questions that like we're curious about in Sustain. 
which I think is only one or two coders who are really actually doing it. We're kind of just actually providing buzz mind around them. You know, we're just sort of bouncing ideas off them. If you're already doing work to figure out metrics for this stuff, that is so cool. And like, please don't spend all the time here talking about the, the newcomers who came in a bit late and said, have you thought about X? And like, yes, we have. So it's my way of trying to be self-deprecating, I guess that's maybe not useful. No, it's perfect. It's, I, I think Sophia's idea of, you know, talking through every, the perspective that you bring, I think we've had some of these conversations. I think we've had them, we've had a lot of conversations in depth. I think you bring, there are perspectives here around funders and types of funders that we haven't discussed before. I think um, the sort of equity questions and the senescence, Lord knows if I spelled that right, um, questions have not really come up directly in this conversation before. So, but many of the things that you, you the categories of things you bring up, like how do we get funding? Um, where, do, where does support come from? Uh, what happens when the maintainer goes away, which in essence is one category of that same problem we have talked about. Yeah. Um, but but having, having sort of your broad perspective, so we understand it, I think is useful for us and also useful for, for hopefully for you to start to situate. Because I think um, when I look at what we're calling our, our MVP metrics, and thank you for whoever indented this correctly, um, you know, just, just listing what your dependencies are is super valuable. And there's not a generally accepted way of doing that. And uh, so, so that's sort of one of our MVPs. Uh, sustainability risk as an MVP is, is something we think we can work towards because it builds on other chaos metrics. Um, dependency range is interesting because how, how many times is a single dep dependency reference? So if you just have a list of dependencies, but you don't know that... Yep. 40% of your files import the same library um, that paints a different picture. Um, Libiers, it, there's a couple of projects listed over on resources and links for calculating Libiers, but David, I'm going to get this wrong. Just explain Libiers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. So <clears throat> ideally, all your libraries that you depend on will be the current versions. Sometimes that's not true. How old is it compared to the current version? If you total it up, that's the total lib years. If you divide that by the number of packages, that's the average number of lib years. And so the like idea that is that if you've got really old dependencies, it's there's probably vulnerabilities in it, and it's probably going to be hard to upgrade. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't have done that in more than five, less than five minutes. So, so thank you. <laughs> um, in just enumerating um, known vulnerabilities, we discussed this a bit last week. There is a public NIST database of known vulnerabilities, but it's incomplete. And so there are existing resources for trying to enhance that. But there is a, obviously there's a connection between vulnerabilities and dependencies, which we're calling out. OSS scorecard possibly um, is both a metric and a tool. I don't know. I'm not sure I can explain what it does quickly and clearly, David. I think you may be more familiar with it. I am. Um, so basically, uh, this is from the Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, they basically yank in some data from the repository um, and score it using a couple measures. And it's completely automated. So it's pulling in things like you know number of committers, how active, and they score each of those from zero to 10 and total it up. And the, the idea is to drive a quick idea of the riskiness of a project. And so if I, I say, if I look at our MVPs and I think about the, our motivate, one of the motivations or the, the organizing motivation around our discussion is, is risk and understanding risk to the projects that we care about. And the motivation of, of some of the new folks is, I could loosely characterize it as making sure that all of the P 
people who contribute to open source are taken care of, that all of the dependencies are addressed with some kind of equity or egalitarian ethic. I think possibly, if I look at these MVPs, my first impression is that they serve both purposes. Um, but I come from it at from the starting from the risk perspective. I'm, do you see value for these kinds of metrics in the work that you're all doing? Very much so. Yeah. Um, these are great. I, I really, I like some of them. Um, I just had a really fun time in my head just now because I haven't been able to explain this problem to a disparate group. I know Georg, I see you all the time, but I, I don't, I don't talk to a lot of you a lot. And so reframing it um, has been really fun for me just now because I've been framing it. How do you, how does it look in 500 years? And so for me, the MVP would include, is it English dependent? Um, what's the ecosystem language like? Is that language going away? Right. Is it entirely written in Fortran? What's the access to that, to this project, to this project? How easy is it for me to learn enough to actually become a committer in the future? That's a, like, for me, that's an interesting question because a lot of the things we depend on are basically just so far down the stack that no one's going to, as a first year coder, ever been able to be able to get there and become a maintainer. And anyone who does get there is going to be, you know, aged out because they'll be like, well, I already have too many other things going on. I can't deal with GCC too. Um, so like, these are like open questions that I have around sustainability in the long term. But I think your MVP is a much better MVP than including these concerns. Well, I, added, I, really, I added I really 500 like your concerns to the list. A... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I think right now I would much more worried about the five years. If it, if, sure. if it will make five, <laughs> 500 is not the problem. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I agree with you. I'm just thinking about what does sustainability mean, right? Because that's that's where I'm coming from. By, um, by the way, you you will be shocked to discover that Fortran is alive and well if you move in certain circles. Yeah, uh, sure. So, so uh, you know, if, if you use machine learning, all that stuff absolutely <laughs> vitally depends on Fortran, and it is not going away, and no one intends it to. No, I um, absolutely <laughs> learned that as we developed our machine learning workers over the last year and, you know, found I had the wrong version of a Fortran compiler installed and uh, had to update that for the first time in my life. So um, to, usually- I'm aware, I'm just, you know, the, <laughs> I, I got into machine learning with Perl. That was what I was taught in my university. I went to university for a master's in machine learning in Germany. And um, I would never get there if I didn't have the resources to do that. And that's an issue for the ecosystem. If the only people who ever touch this stuff have to already have an undergraduate degree to get there easily. If right. everyone who enters coding enters it as a side hobby or through a boot camp and learns JavaScript, they're never going to get down to Fortran. And so what does that mean for the sustainability of your dependencies? If half your dependencies down the line force you to have a 10, 20 year career. So I had a, I had a conversation with some folks about this actually the other day who are focused on fairness in academic software and academics getting credit for software. And kind of the, kind of the, for this really matters for things that are changing, like for civil engineers who rely on, on NLTK or NumPy, the, the nature of physics and materials and the, the algorithms that are in there for those things are not, not changing. So that code is unlikely to change. For people who are doing computational biology or bioinformatics or medical imaging research and want to rely on those same libraries, they probably are going to need new libraries and somebody's possibly going to have to write them in Fortran or new functions in NumPy. Um, so I think it's a little bit domain dependent. Um, but I your think, point I is think well it's very domain dependent. There, there's a huge number of fields where I'm sorry, you don't have, uh, you know, a doctorate in math, you will not understand this. Right. And, you know, saying you've I, but I've got to run it in Perl. No, you are not qualified to write this <laughs> software. And it's not a matter of we don't like you. It's that's not right. But I, but I, I have the O'Reilly book on Pearl. Yeah, I have the O'Reilly book on Pearl. <laughs> I, have, I have a request, though. Can we move back to the MVP? Because because I think we're easily we, the number of metrics. We yeah, could I'm sorry. Add <laughs> is long. Yeah. So this is I, the, I don't want a long list. I think we want a short this is, list. And this is the this, David. This is the MVP metrics. And I, I, I see them. I see them. I want to go back. To it looks great. <laughs> looks great. Let's go back to those. Those look great. I'm excited. Let's make this work happen. Let's dive into one of them and see what we can do here. So 
Um, we so we have repository dependency enumeration, and that is actually whoa, okay, somewhere language level upstream dependency enumeration. I think I think we ultimately changed what we called it. And but I reflected that in the spreadsheet. And now I'm trying to get to my chat window because I'm the sharer. Um, this is a direct link to this metric that we were working on. We have about seven minutes left. Um, you can see we started on this metric last time and we could just spend the last seven minutes or so developing it and give a brief overview. Like I said, it's these are projects my project depends upon. Um, we kind of work in suggest mode because it helps us see what changes are being made. Um, and so we started talking about implementation, parameters, filters, tool. We had a little bit of a discussion about whether some of these things belong around tools or somewhere else. Um, but the description of understanding the code base dependencies embedded in a piece of open source software um, is important. There was some debate about whether or not we should or should not exclude infrastructure focused dependencies. Um, but the, I think at the time, although all this is flexible, um, we agreed that it was more like um, upstream infrastructure dependencies than it was a software dependency. Um, or it exists at deployment or runtime, not necessarily at development time. There's considerable debate about that point, so I'm just going to call it out. Um, and I think there was, there's also been discussion of how we find dependencies. They're largely uh, pulled out through um, package managers, but they also exist as import statements. Um, and then direct, indirect, static, dynamic, and then build, test, and runtime environments. And Kate might be able to, Kate, Kate has, I think, a good example of the difference between a build, test, and runtime environment. If she's a... Yeah, she's here and she's trying to figure out what you have in mind there. Sorry. Well, just that, like, for example, when I'm building a little piece of software that attaches to a device that's in a car, or a boat and Zephyr is running. Yeah, so an, an IoT device, yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Sure, where you've got basically, you've got constrained. Mm -hmm. um, so any, any of the C infrastructure is pretty much make infrastructure and C infrastructure. Um, there are dependencies there that you have to statically link in and things like that, that type of stuff. Yeah. So what are and, you looking for for me? So that's here? at runtime. Those static linkages occur at runtime. Yeah, you, you pretty much, like I say, you can't, if you're working within the constrained environments, everything has to be on your hardware device, which includes all your, you know, dependencies. Whereas in a lot of, you know, modern systems, there's runtimes, and there's potentially services you're working out to and calling yeah. from in the server space. Uh, so that, that there's, you know, I, I wouldn't say build. Uh, I could say the parameters aren't necessarily static or dynamic. The parameters are more. Um, you know, do you have? You know, are you constrained? And for the static dynamic or. Um, well, I, I think not service, that... I, I'd say the one thing that's really interesting these days is uh, expectation of services, which is more than dynamic. Because we're used to dynamically load, linking, you know, lighting, loading libraries and things like that. But what happens if you're calling out to another machine that's using an API to give you a service? Right. That's, I, I think that's a different kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's fine to list that out, but, you know, uh, services as opposed to code. Right. And perhaps that's I a different depend. metric. Possibly. I mean, you know, if you depend uh -huh. on Google Play, um, that's a, you know, that's a big deal in the Android system. Um, so, you know, there are phones which are sell are sold, they're Android, they don't have Google Play but you then don't have certain, certain services that a lot of applications depend and on. And then the other side of it is, you know, interpreters. So you've got the build test runtimes, which is sort of more your traditional embedded. And then you've got things with like the interpretive languages, like your Python runtimes and right. your Run, Perl yeah. runtimes and so forth. Yeah, I, I would just say runtimes. They could be interpretive right. or whatever. Okay. You know, uh, you know the, the, the runtime environment. Well, so I, I've been Python, so. Python, Ruby, right. et cetera. 
got seat back down Something there. Something quiet since I haven't been in all of these past meetings. Uh, I just want to make an observation. It sounds like you we, we do have many different kinds of dependencies. Mm -hmm. right. So this one, if we give it the name language level upstream dependency, then do we want to stay within the same language that the software we are looking at is? Well, so like the build ones, for instance, you have build systems that compile and work with multiple languages to create a binary. So they're not uniformly one language. And so it's, you have to be careful here. Yeah, I mean, like a lot of Python libraries are in Fortran. Really? <laughs> That's what I just heard. Yep, like NumPy. in the last three days. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, if you want to do scientific computing, uh, Fortran's still king. Yeah. So if you want to bring in NumPy, oh. which is the key tool for doing scientific yep. computing in Python, you quickly discover that in at least many ways it's implemented, you're going to re -ank in a Fortran dependency because that's what all the math libraries, libraries mm -hmm. are written in. Okay. Yep. No, yeah. I, I recently had to install NumPy from from the, the the repo for the latest thing they have and learn quickly about that dependency. <laughs> usually, that, usually that's hidden. I'm surprised you discovered it. <laughs> it. It's one of those secrets a lot of people aren't aware of. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was the secret. I work at a I work at a university. I have I, I know people. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think Georg is trying to make it simple. And I, I think the goal of this parameter list was to try to tease out why things aren't simple and then hopefully come back to simplicity. I think it is challenging because um, I mean, you, you could say, you could probably say something like, you know, language level package manager, um, which can sometimes bring in other languages. You know, NumPy being an example. You know, if, if you're a Python developer you, and you import NumPy, you generally don't know. There, it actually all depends on Fortran. And there's a number of Python modules that depend on C. Um, but you generally wouldn't realize it. You just notice that you have a dependency on another library. So, yep, David, Is you there, are uh, you reflected exactly what was going through my mind that I don't right. care about that depth of differentiation. I'm just looking at, I'm a developer, I'm coding in Java. I know how to pull in different Java libraries. Right. Even if they're themselves doing something else, I don't care. Right. Yeah. And the same happens in the Ruby ecosystem and other ecosystems too. I mean, you're yeah. Right. I, I think what you're aware starting... of is, is that language level of of what you're yeah. bringing in. And so just okay. starting there, getting one metric out the door. That's what I, yeah. what my thought was when I read this title. So possibly focusing on, so maybe consider focusing on package managers in this metric is what I'm hearing. Well, uh, well let's be specific. Um, it sounded like we were talking about language level package managers. Yes. And, and that would be basically the, uh, you're, you're looking for an MVP. Now that right. obviously won't help if you're writing in, in C where typically uh, you're using the system level language, uh, package manager. Uh, but, you know, uh, for many people that would still be useful. Yeah, I, and I, I, think, I think maybe, um, maybe starting with this metric because we're at the end of time starting at this metric in the next discussion and starting with the question about language level package managers might be the place to go. My, my question about that is, I know from working on projects like Augur um, and even other things that involve machine learning, and I have dependencies that are not managed by language level package managers. I, I have, software that relies on importing other Git libraries or cloning other Git libraries. like, uh, <clears throat> And so it's not always packaged things that there are things that are not always package managed, but it is perhaps the case that they should be. And I don't, I don't like I, I will overthink this forever. So if this group would just do us all the favor of making a decision 
um, the next time we gather. That is pretty helpful. So um, I'll spell that right later. We are talking about building a separate package manifest, which we'll use to refer to these packages, right? Which will be stored with us every time we scan a dependency, right? <coughs> I don't sure. I, I I confess, I'm not exactly sure what your question is. Okay, so we're building a tool to look at depths. Yep. Right. Okay. Uh, we're building a, we're building a metric that defines what a tool would include when it's looking at depth. So for example, cool. this discussion yeah. about whether or not the metric is constrained by package level, um, language level package managers, that what that does is it stops uh, yep. other people from having three months of debate about what a dependency is. And it just says, yep. we may be right, we may be wrong, but we're gonna count dependencies this way so that we're consistent and we can get our work done. Like. Sure. So a lot of a lot of what we're doing is defining a common language that can be that can be reused and avoid others having to go through these same very long discussions about what is a dependency. These what is these yep. what is a dependency conversations are starting to remind me of the what is a commit conversations I was part of early in the chaos project <laughs> because there were a surprising number of different opinions about what a commit is. So, My wife has the same question. <laughs> Yep. Okay, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to say um, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Um, I, I think uh, hopefully this was, uh, I enjoyed this conversation. Um, welcome to everyone who's new. Welcome to all the folks who have hung in there and helped us build a list of MVPs that we are slowly chipping away at and we'll release the next time Chaos release met releases metrics. And our next meeting is scheduled for March 18th which is the day after St. Patrick's Day. So if you don't have your video on because you're not looking or feeling great, that is not a problem. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good Bye. day. Bye, all. Bye.